Welcome back, and uh, this is the, the final keynote uh, um, presentation for, uh, for today and for the entire school. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Ivano Castelli. Uh, Ivano got his PhD um, at the Technical University of Denmark in 2013 in physics, and then he joined uh, Nicola Marzari's group as a postdoc uh, at the DFL. And then uh, uh, joined back uh, the, the same university, the Technical University of Denmark, but in, uh, in the Department of Energy Conversion and Storage. Uh, his interests are in energy materials, especially in uh, developing and accelerating methods, uh, ab initio methods, uh, to, uh, to design and improve and optimize materials for uh, energy storage and conversion. Ivan. Thank you, Matteo, and thank you all the organizers to invite me here. It is uh, it's very funny. This is my first talk that I gave in Italy. I was born 50 kilometers from here. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in such an historical place and feel uh, basically the vibe of Italian universities. And since I'm the last one before actually your weekend lunch, I have like two hours right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> to present this. No, but uh, um, so. Matteo said, right, I am mostly interested in materials. And normally I start my talk with this slide that is like, you know, we have all seen this is the 17 um, UN goals. And how many of these goals actually require new materials? And when you look at that, uh, then you basically can say that you have no poverty, so, uh, water cl cleaning water, desalination, of course, energy infrastructure. Uh, economic growth because you, know, you want to have uh, cheaper energy, more sustainable cities and communities, uh, climate action, life, uh, both on water and land, and the DNA piece in that. So basically, what we are doing, we can claim that a good part of our of our uh, discoveries can actually impact our future, not only in terms of energy, but also in, in broader sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I said, very historical place, very old universities. I would like to start with some history. And this is basically how we develop new materials. From, uh, let's say, 1500, most of the things were just done on looking at things, right? And then you make an observation and then you make an assumption and, and verify. In the last uh, 400 years, then we start having models, you know, uh, equations that can predict uh, life. But then it's been with the uh, in the last 70 years or so, that actually, you know, computer science really started playing a role. First, with developing of uh, models that can predict, uh, you know, algorithms that can predict properties, and then big data. And what I'm showing you today is basically in this, in this realm. Um, a little bit more history, and now I would like an answer from you. And I take an example from batteries, but uh, basically this is valid for any kind of energy technologies. Uh, when was the first battery invented? Who did it? And when was first commercialized? Depends on what battery. Battery. The, the first time you actually saw the concept of a battery. Yeah, Volta, correct. When? And of, uh, yeah, 1748, Volta, and it took about 150 years to be commercialized. And I mean, Again, this is Pavia, so the southern Milan, but if you go to Como, then you actually have this like very nice Voltian museum. Um, you, know, you take the train, get to the station, go left. It's about uh, 10 minutes from the station, you know, where all the defensive villas and George Clooney lives and so on, but there is actually also the old uh, batteries of Voltian. Of, uh, of it's been in the director of this university for some years. Oh, this is now to uh, Okay, cool. So then, <laughs> that was, was very nice. Yeah, so very nice connection. connection. Yes. Um, great. So let's not now get to the demand batteries. When was invented? Who did it? And when was commercialized? This is in the lifetime of our space. Good enough. Great. That's point number two. Point number one, when was invented first? The 90s. 80s. And when was first commercialized? 91. So it took only 11 years to go from the lab, from the lithium cobalt oxide, to actually having the first Sony battery. Uh, and then the next question is actually, do we have 11 years for the battery of the future? 
And if you ask, uh, you know, if you look at the regulation of the European Union, clearly not because by 2030, we cannot sell any gasoline cars. So then, uh, and we don't have enough lithium if you do the calculation, uh, sorry, enough cobalt if you do the calculation. So means that we have about seven years to go from uh, what we have now to in the lab to having a, pro a battery, not a prototype, a battery in a car, right? And uh, how we do that is basically try to solve the Schrodinger equation, put in a computer, and then you get the device. Uh, and then practical how we do it. You know, you give a computer structure and composition, you calculate properties, you get functionality both back and forth. Um, well, just I, I started doing high throughput in 2010, and this was actually most of the people were putting in material, structure and composition. You calculate the properties and then you start asking yourself, is this something that is good? Is not good for what is good? But then is a score, of course, is very, very slow. How many materials? Edison tried to make the first light bulb. This is the same approach, right? How many different filaments? No, oh, actually, we are at 3,000. Yes, how many PhD students you need to, you need to do the same, right? I mean, we don't have enough PhD students. So this approach is clearly faulty because you have a success of one out of 3,000, considering Edison. Um, and PhDs are expensive, by the way. So that's not good. Enough. But we want to do the other way around. We want to go from properties to materials. So we we start trying to optimize different properties, the materials based on the properties. In this case, uh, it could be a band structure or a diffusion property and so on. And really, the clear part, the, the, the very important part is the descriptors. So how to connect a property that you that you calculate on a computer with the properties that you measure in experiments. Uh, this is really, in, in some cases, it could be quite tricky. And um, basically what I'm gonna show is all DFT, as we are at the DFT school. So we are at, at a nanoscale and pico, uh, sorry, nanometer and picosecond, uh, quantum mechanical calculation, but then we can also bridge and use this approach also going up the scale and going for multi-scale But I'm not quite covering that. First example. This is, as I say, was my PhD project and was a try to find new materials for water splitting. And I'm going there to automation. That's why I'm taking it for, further away. So why water splitting? Because, you know, when you do a P, when you get a PV, then you create electricity, how do you store electricity? The idea here is that instead of having electricity, you're storing to chemical fuels. So you solve the problem of uh, a displacement of demand and production, both in time and, play, and, uh, and, uh, and space, right? I mean, you can imagine you can you could create hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules in the desert here, and then have a pipe that brings you hydrogen and oxygen in Europe, where it's like you have less insulation. Or you produce in the summer and then use in the winter. I mean, suddenly you go, you have a lot of sun, but as I was saying, some of you will have spent in the evening. We have only seven hours of light in in Denmark in the winter. You do not produce any hydrogen with solar power, right? So there is no sun at all. Means that you need to save it for the wind. So um, the first example was uh, there's a gallium nitride zinc oxide in the late uh, 2010 or so, uh, where you actually have a material that is able to absorb light, create an electronal pair. The electronal pair reach the surface. The hydrogen, the electron is used to, to evolve hydrogen. The oil is used to evolve oxygen. So it's a kind of a tricky problem because you need a material that is stable, stable in water with good light harvesting and good catalytic properties. So this is, is not so, uh, so trivial. And there are a bunch of materials here that could do the trick, but some of them have a very large band gap. So above three, basically. So if you know the solar spectrum, where is the high intensity is 1.1. Or 1.3, sorry. Above three, you have 2% efficiency, so forget about it. Uh, then some materials are good to run only one or two reactions. For example, silicon could run the hydrogen evolution, but not the oxygen evolution. Molybdenum disulfide does the opposite. Some of them are non stable in contact with water. Uh, we have an example of rust. The rust is very stable. Uh, the problem is that you have a very low recombination length. So your electron will never reach the surface. So at that point was a, a good idea to start looking into this and, and to run a screening basically to, to do that. So what I, what I did was taking a perovskite, 
uh, decorate that with about 50 elements from the table in the A, B position, you end up with a table like this where you have about two and a half thousand candidates. The lower triangles is the, the stability, the higher triangle is the band gap that is a you know, descriptor for the fishes in the solar cell, or, and then you find out when you have red and red that the material is good. Then you can go beyond and also looking at the position of the band edges, and you end up with about 20 different candidates that uh, some of my colleagues tried in, in the lab, and some of these actually uh, were found to work. So that some of the oxynitride uh, materials are the, one of the most known water specific materials at that point. And we had to develop a methodology to calculate the full bay diagram, so stability in water, that you can find here. I'm not going into detail there because I would like to show you a bit of how to be out automate the process in this. But this was, uh, you know, it's quite uh, nice and fun, um, but it was all good. And just to, to take it a bit, uh, bit back, how do we actually do a screening? And uh, so you have this kind of funnel. First, you try to look at properties of the elements, so you don't want any element that is expensive and toxic and so on. Then you can use data mining or screening through available databases. You can start looking at the stability, electronic properties, and then interface. And the important thing is that going from left to right, you increase the complexity. So you're reducing gradually the number of, of, uh, of materials to, uh, to calculate. But still, I mean, you need a person here at each one of these steps to submit a new calculation and then look at the results and then submit the calculation. And, you know, you have different parameters and then you end up to the mess. So uh, the question is how autonomous is this? And uh, how do we concatenate the steps? And how do we deal with errors? And I can tell you when I was doing that, I thought I, would, I did an amazing way where you know everything was just by one click, but indeed I had to click every time, right? So it was it was not that that uh, autonomous. Um, so yeah, don't tell any students that I did that. But that's uh, that's so the thing was this: we want to go from something that is a Lego box uh, that is disorganized, non-transferable, irreproducible, and time-consuming because it needs your time. So computer time is cheap compared to your time. To this, where you know you have a you have a break when you when you start them on each other. So something that is modular, standardized, transferable, interoperable, integrable with experiments, that this is the dream. Of course, that is fair, autonomous, accelerated, reproducible. And I say reproducible again because uh, you know you want to have something that you don't want to change the parameters. Because when you run things by yourself, then there is, you make, I mean, people make error. If you have a script, then it's always the same parameter. We were talking yesterday about how we do it, and using workflows is a way to, to, to remember what the way you did. So uh, now I, I, I show you another example of how we make these autonomous. And this is taken from uh, cathode materials for magnesium and battery. Uh, why magnesium? I say that lithium is multivalent, as an increased capacity compared to lithium and there's much abundant resources. But then we have unstable electrolytes and the, the cathode materials have a low open circuit voltage and a relatively bad uh, charge discharge rate. Now the open circuit voltage here is 1.1 volt compared to 3.7 of lithium ion batteries. And the tip example from magnesium ion, but the method is general. And basically everything that I show you today, it's chemistry agnostic. So you can use it for, for everything. So sorry, it's chemistry neutral and technology agnostic. So you can use it for everything, uh, both in terms of chemistry and in terms of the technology you want to use. Instead of using for batteries, you can use it for fuel cells. It's the same methodology, right? We don't want to have to invent new things all the time. Um, so what we did was uh, try to automate all the calculations of key thermodynamics and kinetic properties. And what are the key properties? One is, this, of course, stability and then open circuit voltage, because we want to accelerate that to have a better open circuit voltage, and then having a fast diffusion. And this is relatively simple because it's all in thermodynamics. When you get to kinetics, it's where the real problem starts. And when you real problem is both conceptual, but also in terms of time. I mean, this takes one or two orders of magnitude more than that. And uh, the materials we put as input can come from the ICSD materials project, or as a structured prototype. So we will give a telescope and then you decorate with unknown materials, right? So it's it's a game very general. So this is what the workflow does on the back. You do 
you, you calculate a, a optimized unit cell, calculate stability with and without uh, the cation, the intercalating ions. We can calculate vacancies. You can calculate any views. So the nudge elastic band method to calculate the pathways and get the diffusion. And this is all something that does automatically, right? You can see all the arrows going up and down. What you need to remember is the input. Basically, what you need to decide is giving the intercalating ion, magnesium, the material ID or the, the structure, and then some properties, some parameters, sorry. And that's it. And when you get out, as a volume that gives you stability, uh, open circuit voltage and diffusion properties. So this is like the three, the three outputs. Basically, you can give it to a student, a bachelor student that has no clue about DFT and just a bit of coding. They use DFT as a black box, but they can do it, right? So it's a matter of uh, of uh, a couple of days of uh, of the learning curve rather than adding months. Um, so all the, the workflow is implemented with MyQ, that is the workflow engine, ASC for dealing with structure and composition, and then I'm not using quantum first. So, uh, yes, I use that. <laughs> or they use that. <laughs> so, but, the, but the method could be used also, for, I mean, could be in integrated with any kind of code I will show you. So uh, basically what the workflow does is the, doing these nine different structures, where you calculate the stability, and then you have a threshold of 0 0.2. Uh, you have an open circuit voltage. To so you calculate the open circuit voltage based, based on the energy difference between the structure with and without uh, cations. And then you calculate the diffusion using the NEB. So you take a low state of charge where you remove only one ion, and then you look at the vacancy mobility, and the high state of charge when you have only one intercalating ion, and then you look at the, at the mobility of that. Um, so how many of you have done any calculations before that? Okay, how tricky is that? Or how, yes, great. I did not pay you to, to give that answer, right? So this is great. So it takes you forever. And because you give it, you need to relax the input structure, the final structure, and then you need to relax all the, the images in between. And typically you need, let's say five images. And each one of them takes a while, so it takes a lot. But then there are different ways to accelerate this. And uh, there is machine learning, there is you know, different ways. What we do is just using symmetry. So basically most of the barriers have a mirror symmetry in the middle, right? So it means that if we can calculate half of it and then mirror it, then we already set almost a factor of two. And this is what we do here, right? So we have a, a so-called reflective lapse where instead of doing the full path, we do half of it and then we, we double it up. But then we can further accelerate that and say, you know, in most of cases, the middle point is actually where you have the transition state. And then you calculate only the initial point, the finding is reflected, and then in the middle. Uh, for the one of you that uh, work with uh, uh, multivalent cations, you are aware of the dumbbell shape of the barrier, right? But then you know that it cannot go below, the barrier cannot be lower than this point. So it means that you, if you already know that the diffusion is bad, you can discard it. But if the diffusion is good, then you can do this like reflective nab and getting actually the real, uh, the real transition. Uh, so we have a sort of a, a concept here where we don't want to get the exact barrier, but we want to know to accelerate that. So we first try to get the, what is the sort of the lower best or the, the lower worst with the reflective middle image, and then we get the, the, the real barrier only if that is right. Otherwise, we discard it. Um, we do this, uh, so we have just a few results. We take about 100 materials from the ICSD. We calculate uh, stability and voltage. We calculate OCD, diffusion barrier. And then we end up with this magnesium vanadate that is one of the possible good materials that one of our collaborators in Spain is trying to, uh, to synthesize. But again, I mean, this, uh, we have used it also for calcium ion batteries and the, the method is, is really the same. Uh, we have tried also different ways to, uh, to, to find, the, basically to find the transition state because if we find the transition state, then we can do anything with only one point. And uh, I'm not going to in the details here, but one was uh, to use a geometrical descriptor, in particular the Chebyshev uh, Center in Boronoid Installation, where we use that to find what is the, the transition point and then run the NEB all on that point, or using uh, surrogate models. 
So we find out that uh, if you have a fully charged uh, ion, then a minimum of the um, electron density corresponds in most of the cases of the transition state. So then we get to that point, and then from that we can just run a one single image on the application. And in that way, we have actually quite a good uh, uh, error compared to, to running the human image. I mean, here we are doing a screening, right? So we, we cannot aim to have anything at the mini electron volt, right? We want to have something that is good enough to reduce the 99% material that are actually useless. And then you can do more, more into uh, the, the materials that are actually good. So, uh, yeah, basically that was uh, was the, the example I had in mind about the what the workflow. But then you know conductivity start for us was very interested this thing, and I want to show you the interoperability of the method. Why uh, conductivity is actually playing a crucial role in many of the technologies that we have every day. You know, I show you an example of battery electrodes. We have solid state electrolytes, sensors, uh, 2D and cell so materials, catalysts. Oxygen ionics, fuel cells, these are all things where conductivity plays a role and where we don't have materials that, that actually are good enough, right? So now I'm taking you uh, or guiding you through some of the way that we can play Lego. You know, Denmark Lego is kind of a big thing. So uh, imagine you have a Lego box and each one, each Lego is a simple calculation, the most simple one, right? And you want the output of one becomes the input of the next one and vice versa. And you can stack them in different ways. So reducing your task to the most simple uh, um, bit. So this is something we've done for, you know, when I show you for new battery chemistries, we do relaxation, we calculate formation energy, we calculate uh, chemical stability, phase stability, volume change. Then I get a super cell vacancy formation energy to get to the open circuit voltage and then migration to get to the diffusion. Um, so this was what, what I show you. Now, oh, of course, uh, less. So then, then you can imagine to add not only a slide, but you want to suddenly to get the electrochemical stability window. So telling you basically what is the stability window in a, a, the electrochemical stability window of a cat, of a, of a, um, of a solid state electrolyte. And then you can imagine that you know you split your Lego break and you put in another column. And that is what I do in the next slide. Well, basically you take the, the structure from the materials project and you calculate what is the potential where your electrode is uh, or electrolyte is stable. And you get to something like this. This was done for the antiperovskites in uh, um, for solid state electrolyte. Then you can see that most of these are actually stable until about one and a half or two volts versus uh, lithium metal. And this is all autonomous, right? And can be integrated in what you have before. Again, I mean, input becomes the output, sorry, output becomes the input, right? So you try to make this in all concatenate. And this is uh, basically the screen that we have run. We took exactly this, and then we had only one extra block. And then we take about, uh, 6,000 different antiperoskite materials. So antiperoskite, you know, normally perovskite, you have the octahedra that is a, a made of oxygen, so negative, and then the two cations are positive. In this case, it's wrong. So the octahedra is positively charged, and the A and B cation are negative. And because of that, in principle, you could have a higher, well, you have a higher conductivity because you have uh, um, and, and higher capacity because now you have three lithiums instead of only one, but you pay a bit of stability. So we ended up, uh, you know, you calculate a convex hole, band gap, stability, and then we use this surrogate model I mentioned before to get the, uh, the barriers. And then some of these are the, the, the materials that have actually been already found, like the lithium bromate, sodium bromate, and so on, and some of the other ones. Are, so we are actually very confident we found the materials that were known, and we claim that we have something. I'm not an experimentalist, I stay very far away from lab, but if you know we have colleagues that they try to do that and uh, and, and tell us yes or yes. But then, you know, as I said, chemistry agnostic, uh, technology agnostic, fuel cells. So, uh, you know, if you have a, a water splitting, then you form hydrogen and oxygen. 
But how do you recombine them to make uh, electricity? And one way is uh, fuel cells. Uh, but then we start looking at the proton conducting because you know you conduct uh, protons instead of uh, oxygen vacancy, so it's faster. Uh, you have a lower operational temperature. The kinetics and dynamics is better. You have a higher tolerance for recycling and much lower cost. You can use the simple ceramics. But then you require an anode that is able to do the hydrogen oxidation reaction. So with a high electron conductivity and it is able to generate protons, the electrolyte with a high uh, proton mobility and must be an insulator, and the cathode that can run the oxygen reduction reduction and has again a high proton conduct uh, electron conductivity and then consume protons. So the one of you that are electrochemists or chemists in general know that the oxygen reduction reaction is a beast and you have higher number of potentials and you know, it's not the, the simplest reaction to run. So again, uh, we, we came in and say, we can try to solve it. And uh, uh, we are looking at this in, uh, in, in different ways using basically high entropy alloys. And you know, the, the method is even more complicated because uh, I, if you're interested in uh, proton conducting fuel cell, this is a great review. And you can see here, there are a bunch of materials that we can do different tricks, but also different, different ways of doing it, where the reaction can happen on the cathode, on the interface between the cathode and the electrolyte. You could have materials that conduct protons, conduct electrons, conduct uh, oxygen vacancy, can conduct all three, so they use all the surface to run the ORR reaction and so on. So, you know, we have so many different parameters we can optimize on this. And of course, we don't want to reduce to the simplest case because maybe we are just uh, like excluding something that is much more interesting or much more uh, futuristic than, than the rest. So uh, what we do is again, you know, we take the Lego bricks and now we actually add, uh, we already have the oxygen vacancy formation energy, if you remember uh, for the lithium or magnesium, but now we have also the proton intercalation energy. So we have the same structure of the work flow up to here. And then instead of adding lithium or taking out lithium, we have protons. Uh, and again, I mean, this is done all in the same, the same way. Uh, basically, it's my students that they, they do this and they use the same, the same work. So you can see this is the, the logic behind you. In this case, we use the structure prototype. So we take perovskites so or different, both cubic and layered. Um, we decorate them, we calculate the electron conductivity using the Boltzmann, uh, Boltzmann equation, and then we look at the conductivity both in the oxygen, so we create vacancies, we look at the vacancy uh, mobility um, of one oxygen, two oxygens, we do the same when we insert the protons. And then we get, you know, migration barrier both for oxygen and hydrogen, and from that we can try to, to make them the best possible. Uh, now, this is a TFT school, so this is probably the only method, uh, the equal method that slide that I have. And it's like which exchange correlation function we use. And this is very important because, uh, you know, with high throughput, we try to be as uh, fast as possible, but very often it's just you know, blanket, means that fast is actually not accurate. So, how do we make this the best? And what we do is uh, taking different, uh, five different materials, this is all perovskites. We have uh, strontium cobalt niobate, strontium iron niobate, some of the barium zirconate, uh, some of the uh, high entropy, and strontium titer. And you know, when you do the relaxation, basically all PBE functions work fairly okay. You can see that here they work, I mean, within a 1% error, that is, is, is fine, that is more or less the cues they want. Um, it becomes a bit more tricky when you look at vacancies. Uh, we have a very similar results for most of the GGA functions. Uh, HEC behaves a little bit differently. We don't know yet why, right? So we are looking at the one oxygen going from one place to the, to the next. One. And uh, I mean, we we're talking in the last few days about uh, how to use the plus U when you do NEB calculations, and you should be very careful because in most of the cases, NEB is fine. But if you have an occupation, the electronic occupation that, that, that changes drastically during the hopping, then you might need to use a different U. So that was when I was referring that we should try the plus U plus V because, or different methods, uh, because you, you might want to check 
that the U is consistent, or you cannot, you might not uh, use a consistent U through the entire path. Um, again, in most cases it's fine, but you need you need to make sure that you don't change the equation. Uh, and then uh, uh, we do the same for the hydrogen interstitial, and we found uh, quite good uh, energies across all the uh, the functionals. Uh, PB Sol was giving some weird results for SFO here. Uh, and again, for the diffusion, we have a, we have consistent result. Again, be careful if you use Blasi. So the question, uh, oh, I killed it. this one. The question now is this one. Can we actually have one function at the root mole? And uh, well, this is very boring uh, because our answer was uh, yes, we just use PV. Right, so then we, we just uh, decide to go for the simplest way, and we know that PD works, so we go for that. So uh, this was the output of all the screen, this benchmark. But I think we learned a lot because you need to be aware of the kind of function that you use when you start. Because if you use something that is not accurate enough, then you know you don't get uh, things that are uh, consistent. And uh, yeah, let me go back now to the, to the results. And this is something that we are doing for uh, near tender oxygen conductors. So similar way when we look at mobility, you can see how we start with about 6,000 structures. We have a uh, thousand uh, that they, they are stable, that they are, uh, that we do relaxation. Basically we look at uh, what kind of matching between A and B cation you can use. And if you have a, a wrong number of electrons, Oh. So uh, yes. So we start with uh, with about six thousand structures or five thousand structure. Then we look at uh, what combination of A, A and B cation we can use, and you know we want some material that is an insulator. So if we know that the sum of the of the electrons is uh, even. Then we expect that you know you have at least always a band, sorry, out, you have always a band across the Fermi level, so that cannot be an insulator. So then we end up with a thousand structure to relax, calculator like a convex hole, and about 800 are stable, uh, only 123 have band gap, then we can calculate bears and so on. And, and then we end up with a with a map like this where we have you know, oops. I'm, I'm not going to into the detail there, but you can see that some of these have a very low energy barrier, below 0 0.1 electron volt. This is oxygen, oxygen barrier, and this is actually really good for, for this kind of, uh, of, of device or, uh, or materials. Uh, and now we have uh, one of our colleagues that uh, made, I think it's this one here, so it's the strontium niob uh, scanning niobate. And, um, that actually was demonstrated to be conducting. So now we, we are going to turn more into, into and try to understand what are the problem properties of that. Uh, beyond uh, uh, beyond conductors, we are also looking at defects in PD materials. So again, we take our Lego bricks. Now we calculate the formation energy of the of the PD material. We look at supercell defect formation energy density thing. And then we are looking also at ion migration then. So remember, I mean, all of this is basically, you know, it's like having a shelf and then from the shelf, you're taking whatever you want. Uh, and you build up these kind of fancy, semi-fancy diagrams. Uh, well, the, the aim is to go even further. And uh, what we have as available bricks is uh, morphology, it's a fancy term for relaxation, uh, electronic properties, vacancy and interstitials. And now we are adding different calculation and, and connectivity. You know, you can, these are some, just some of the applications that we are looking at that read uh, uh, who gave me money. Uh, but in principle, you could use that for, for anything that comes to, to, uh, to your mind. Um, now a bit of vision for what we are trying to get for furthermore. Uh, as I said, I mean, the title was Autonomous workers for materials and interfaces. And this is the first time I mentioned interface, and it's been 40 minutes. Uh, because actually, when you start looking at interface, it's even more complex. Because now, now, when you have a bulk, you have a very simple way to describe it. 
uh, basically a SIG file, but when you have an interface, how do you actually do a leading, uh, sorry, not solid liquid interface? What, uh, how do you def define that? You start having different terminations, uh, um, different uh, like um, oxygen coverage or water coverage and so on. So actually making a workable interface, we are still a little bit behind. Uh, so these are some of the examples taken from two years ago about different uh, um, like databases, and most of these actually already contain only five properties. There are very few public related databases that have data from interfaces, right? That is going beyond a simple absorption energy. So it's something that uh, it requires for many of the technologies that we are looking at. And our suggestion here was to go modular. So basically using again the idea of Lego bricks and making simple workflows or simple, the most simple task, and then build it up upon each other. Because you know, go if you go the smaller, then you can reuse it, then you can clearly define what is the, the purpose of the Lego brain. So this is the first vision. The second is interoperability. And uh, you know, I say that I use the VASP, uh, but what happens if you want to have one task done with VASP, one task done with Quantum Espresso? One done with the GPUs or the code that we have in STU, and so on and so forth. And how, really, how reliable is that? And this is a work that we are doing together with uh, Nicola Marzari, Giovanni Pizzi, and some of the big map friends. Basically, we are trying to develop this workflow up to the OCV, the NEB for now, the, the, modernity, the kinetic properties for now, we are leaving it aside because right. complexity, basically, with different. Uh, Workflows engine and TFT codes. So we use MyQ and VASP, that's the original work, but then we are also using AIDA and Quantum Espresso, SimStack, so from 3DS and VASP, uh, and sorry, from KIT and, and VASP, and then we use uh, the 3DS and CAST. And you can see here, this is the open circuit voltage for the lithium cobalt oxide that across the structure you have, a, I mean, you have some discrepancies. But they are not that bad, considering that they are using both different workflows engine and different DFT codes. Right? I mean, already doing two different people using the same DFT code might get different results. Here you have different people using different codes, so it's, it's much more complex. Uh, but in principle, it means that here you can run different bits and pieces with different codes. So uh, the point would be that you know you run AIDA and Quantum Espresso for the thermodynamics part and then come and run the kinetics with VASP because it's something that we have implemented. It means that you don't need to re-implement all workflows and uh, like um, mindset behind it, right? I mean, all the workflow protocols, you could just use whatever you, you like. So in principle, you could have a, a library of workflows across different codes and across different engines. And then uh, the, the last visual is integration and experiments. So yeah. for now, yeah. I've shown you only DFT, so only atomistic scale. The yeah. one, more, one step further is integrating with multi scale. But what about if you have uh, a, an experiment, right? So then you can say, I have my code that asks for experiments, get the results, gets back to me, uh, asks for a new, a new calculation. You can integrate with, uh, um, with AI, so different levels of optimizers and so on. And this is what we are trying to do with this Finales, this uh, fast integration agnostic learning server together with uh, Engelstein from the KIT and you know, some of the friends also here at the EPFL, uh, basically creating this kind of infrastructure that allows to run simulation and AI and uh, uh, modeling all remotely and all from different places. So it's all across Europe with three or four different universities uh, because you also have an ontology integrated to that, means that you can run and ask our colleagues at KIT, please uh, run these, simula these experiments uh, and uh, using one optimizer that we have in DTU to optimize the kind of parameters that you want to use for, uh, for running the next, uh, uh, ne next synthesis. Uh, and we are actually having a run to, to demonstrate this uh, in, in a couple of weeks for actually three weeks time where the point would be to not have anybody uh, that has to interfere with the with this with this system. Um, I will let you know how it goes next. Year. Uh, so the goal is actually going to something like this, where now again you have uh, some of this is the usual friends of EFT, but then you have 
uh, maybe a genetic model that tells you this kind of new structure to calculate. Uh, you have a some autonomous synthesis robot that does the that does the robot. You have some kind of level of autonomous spectroscopy, could be you know, computational spectroscopy autonomous experiments that tells you how things are going and feeds back. And then you have you know up to testing or something. So I think with the full circle uh, of development uh, where you actually don't need any any. But how we do that, and uh, uh, I mean, this is how we would like to do. The, the point is actually how we actually uh, deal with the amount of data that comes from so many different sources. And uh, I'm taking an example from BigMap, that is uh, the project that uh, you know, basically pays this kind of works, both of them. Um, that is a EU project that started three years ago and is about 30, 34 partners across Europe to develop the batteries of the future. So you have uh, experiments, you have theory, you have industry, you have AI, you have basically everything, right? Uh, and you can see here that, you know, this is one of the usual Gantt chart or charts where you see how the different work packages integrate with each other. You have uh, some of the most common uh, sort of work, atom scale, multi-scale, characterization, uh, synthesis, uh, you have AI at the end, but then at the center you have what, what we call the machinery of the project, that is having a data infrastructure, having an ontology that tells you how are the relation between the, the, the battery parts and having a standard protocol, because you want to make sure that everything is done in the same way, right? Even if it's across people. So you can imagine it's about 40 partners, 150 people, Again, how can you deal with data produced by 100 people, 150 people, when every two years the quality of leaves and change? Uh, and that was uh, where we start, uh, you know, data really important here, also because uh, you want to make this interoperable loop, right? So you want uh, data from modeling that are read by experimentalists, and that need to be clear. You need to have a clear link between experiments and field, and so on. So, uh, we brought the data management plan about uh, three years ago. It's uh, we managed to publish here. If you're interested, go in and check the supplementary material because it's 140 pages of what kind of data are produced in the project. It was a kind of a headache uh, because actually data is not only results of experiments. It's all these things, here, right? So it's it's a lot of different things. But what is crucial is what we call the data table. So not only the data that you generate in the work package, but also how you deliver them and how you collect. Them. So this is an example taken from, well, I'm a modest person, so I put myself in center. Uh, I do simulations, right? So, but how I want to simulate something and what I can deliver is probably some properties about the material that I, that, that I, that I got, or that I simulated. So maybe structure and uh, different like, you know, stability and so on. And what I can get again from characterization could be an uh, extra dispatch or uh, something that tells me, you know, try to simulate this material. And all of this, when you go to all the work pack work pages, can make you this kind of plot where you have an infrastructure in the middle, and here we use the one at EPFL materials cloud. Uh, you have a standards and, and ontology that tells you the relation between between things. And then all the the different work packages uh, connected to, right? So you have uh, the simulations and you have uh, more like experiments, you have AI, and you can see the flow of data across. If you're interested in the kind of system or machine that we use, you can check the, uh, this, this kind of these papers. Uh, let me spend a few words more about the infrastructure here. So the idea is that you as a user, you don't interact directly with the data. But you have an app store where I could, I make an app. I make a, let's say an uh, autonomous uh, characterization app. I put it on the app store, and you can download that. That interacts directly with the with the with the data infrastructure. And for the data infrastructure, we have two different levels of openness. One that is open for the entire community, and one is that it is restricted. We have a, a, we have industrial partners that don't want to share the data with outside the project. We have you know, IPR and so on. Plenty of lawyers that they complain if we have everything open. Uh, so you want to have these levels of security to ensure that nothing is actually protected. And in principle, you could have models that run on the data that are protected. You don't even see the raw data, but you just get the model out of it, right? So for the companies, this is all secure. 
the goal, I mean, Bitmap is part of the Battery 2030 Plus that is a larger consortium on battery, uh, battery discovery. We have, uh, when we start, we have six projects, now we have about 15. And the goal is actually to create this uh, EU battery data landscape, where you have, I put Bitmap in the center, but uh, really the data of the batteries in the center, where you connect different different projects. So Eden or Bath Forever could be interested in, in some of the modeling part. And some of the things that they produce, they are connected with part of whose, you know, you can see all the different connections. And the goal is to, to expand this beyond the Battery 23 Plus Consortium and go also for beta and Battery Zero. So really creating a, a better infrastructure where you collect all the data produced in new battery projects. And in principle, going beyond batteries and including also uh, other technologies, because uh, some of the materials that we, we study here could be used also for something else. Yes, so this is basically my conclusions. And uh, well, I hope that uh, I convinced you to play a bit more Lego. Uh, so create workflows, create, create them in a way that is like the simplest possible. And with uh, this idea of being modular, cross platform and linked with experiments. And uh, and try to, to fulfill like the or to adhere to the uh, sort of common guidelines for data infrastructure. So don't use your own way of, of storing things because you never know in five years' time maybe somebody's coming to you and say, Oh, I was really interested in your PhD project or your postdoc project. You want to collaborate with that and you want to make sure that you don't have to go in and spend all the time a month of your time to, to redo the calculations or to, to redo the projects. Uh, acknowledgements, well, most of my PhD, so Felix was the first one doing the workflow, and now Benjamin, Armando, Lotte, Simon are uh, going on with that, each one with different, uh, with different technology, but again, are all interoperable, and some of my colleagues are here, one man and ties for, for the discussion, and then, of course, uh, the big map and uh, Battery 2030 Plus team for all the work that we are doing together on the uh, data infrastructure is not something that one single person, one single group can do. And fundings uh, mostly is the well EU for Big Map and uh, Better Twenty Thirty Plus, and the uh, Danish Research Council for some of the work I show you on fuel cells on on batteries. And thanks again for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the very inspiring and motivating uh, work. Thanks. Uh, questions, wow. And then it's first, and then Woody. All right, thanks a lot. It was really nice. I have actually two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is when I talked to you for the DTU, I was already expecting that you would be more oriented towards working with the free platform in the ASC and the workplace there. What I didn't know is that you actually are part of the first state from the ASC. It's really cool. Like, you know actually, that's the second paper. Was it? Oh, right. The first paper is from 2004, and there was still a high school student, I think. Oh, right. But right. nobody has actually decided, but it was uh, no, soon yeah. and Jakob said yes. But this, I mean, you know that you support 90% of all the computation on the field of science that you can, like people do around the world. So it's yeah, we should get better with quantum expression. Yeah, okay. that's... <laughs> but, yeah, so, but also you were in central collaboration and you were part of it within Switzerland and also, yeah, you also already know about Aida and the work that is being put into there. So I guess you were the perfect person to ask this question, like how would you, Push these two workflows engines because you also have like this connect simulation piece and the, yes. So you, uh, what are the advantages of using one of each and where you think are because uh, we also hear about like one of the drawbacks of a user doing like the overhead and user friendliness mm -hmm. bit, and where you think it could be improved upon like maybe. Uh, using some design forces that you have for ASC and yeah. yeah, this is a very good question. And I mean, I, I, I mean, I use ASC on my everyday life. And my queue is actually something you build upon ASC. Mm -hmm. So ASC gives only with structure, and my queue is only workflow engine, right? And the good part of my queue is that you have a very low entry level. So it's something that you can learn to use within. Uh, 
half a day if you know a little bit of, uh, of computers. I mean, if you're not a newbie, right? But uh, so the entry level of my queue is very low. Uh, it's very simple. The problem is that you don't really, I mean, the provenance is something that is still missing. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, you mentioned the atomic scale recipe, uh, which is uh, a part of the code that is developed by uh, DTU Physics, mostly by Christian Chusen. And uh, the idea with that is that you submit the calculation just from the common line. So giving a, let's say you want to do a relaxation, you say ASR relax, and you give a seed file, and then you do the relaxation. And that uh, works very well. I tried a few times when it was very new, so it was not working well. But I heard that this, it works very well if you have to do, I mean, mostly they do 2D materials. So it's just sim uh, structure like that. So if you want to do simulations on uh, electronic properties, mm -hmm. I think that's what they what they go for. We don't currently have a, a, a ASR for any B calculations. Now you can actually do a workflow, but it's mostly for thermodynamics property. When you go for any Bs, then you have so many exceptions that doing that from a common line is 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 still very hard. Uh, I still like the idea that you can code and not just have a common line. But I understand that some of the tasks you can you can do that very simply. Uh, and then I either, I mean, I used that when I was with Nicola in 2014 and 15. And at that point, the entry barrier was very high. So I think that uh, I mean the, the part that discouraged me the most at that point was that it's very it, it does so many things that is great, but you need to learn it properly. And uh, and I wanted something, I mean, when I when I started my group, I wanted something that was much simpler, uh, because I mean, I, I mean, at that point, we didn't think much about provenance. Uh, we were more into technology. I mean, we are at the Department of Energy, so for us, most of the uh, like funding is to develop new technologies. And that was something that is easy, and something in principle can easily combine with experiments. So for me, my cue is the way to go when you want something simple that works in a short time. So um, in your work, basically you start with data data material, then high throughput filtering, mm -hmm. and you end up with a handful of promising candidates. Yes. So what about the inverse design? When you say, I want this property, what would, be, what would be the material with this property? So what do you think about it? Are you planning to use it or you are already? Well, we are already doing that, basically, because you could say that uh, the inverse is, well, there are, the original concept of inverse design was uh, you want to optimize a property, right? So you can say, I take uh, lithium, uh, well, strontium titanate for water splitting, the band gap is too large, so I replace strontium with calcium, you know, that, because that is sort of a mix between inverse design and data mining, so sort of to optimize property. Then if you look at what is what inverse design is now, is actually using a closed loop um uh, material discovery so where you actually include also machine learning so basically where you have a, an optimizer in the back that tells you oh, you should try to calculate that material and uh, i mean so it's it, it's a bit more complex than what was 10 years ago uh, we are using very little machine learning mostly because it's the number of structures that we have is not enough to train uh, but also because i don't like to use something in a black box idea. So, I mean, I, I care about discovering new material, but for me, it's also important to understand the physics and chemistry behind that. And so far, I mean, there are branches of machine learning like explainable AI that tells you something, but we are still a bit pioneering that. So I, I, I think the before going to the machine learning, we need to have a method that allows us to do the calculation in a simple way. And that was what, what was we do? But, but basically, yes, we are already doing the in inverse design. Yeah, but more philosophical. So I mean, this, this is initiatives twenty greater is twenty thirty plus, and then by twenty fifty have a, a carbon neutral society. Or so, do you think uh, we can get there? What about like Africa? They're not behind. Well, there was a call. There is a call that closes uh, next week about uh, decarbonization of Africa. So from the EU, actually. So Europe is also interested in that. I mean, we cannot put the regulation for us and then dump all our old batteries in China or, or Africa, right? So I think that is an effort that we have to do for everybody because we can. 
And uh, I mean, uh, 10 years ago, there was a talk, I heard a talk where saying, you know, it's not that important to make a, a, a one kilowatt uh, 10 cents cheaper for us. What really matters is making, uh, getting the effect with electricity. Right? So it's basically what we need to do is, is global. That is, goes maybe a little bit against what the European Union does now with all the protection of data. But uh, then they ask us to be open, but at the same time, they don't want us to be too open. So it's a bit, but I think we should look at the global scale and not really care of where, because we, I mean, in Denmark, we don't have enough sun to do solar stuff. So, I mean, I would be very happy of sending my things to a place where it's very sunny and get something back out of it. Question? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you um, I have a question about this um, diffusion barrier of temperature screening with NUB. Mm -hmm. So my experience with NUB is that it's very slow when you're lucky. And sometimes it just breaks because the initial gas you provided is very uh, yeah. long. But there's no way we're doing the preliminary interpolation of the atomic coordinates. And uh, there will be overlapping between two atoms from the time to time. And just, the DFT code cannot handle that. So I'm wondering, do you encounter that a lot going for high throughput uh, research and uh, if it's how do you manage to solve that? Yeah, so the answer is yes. And there are two ways of, do, of solving it. So if you do a structure prototype approach, then the answer is no, because you have one pair of sky and you always have the same kind of repeat, right? So you know that the transition state most likely will be in that order. It's more complex if you look at the ICSD when you have different phases, different structure and compositions. Uh, some of the solutions that we found was actually using these methods. So uh, doing Voronoit oscillation or looking at the electron density was a way that we could identify where the transition state was. And then avoiding this kind of overlapping between the atoms. So the point here was actually not to find the value of the barrier, but finding where the transition state is, and then running one one single point calculation. And that was actually fairly, it's much faster. Okay, yeah. So you just sort of already know where the barrier is. Yes, uh, so you know where the transition state is, and means that you can do one single calculation on that point. And you still get accuracy, the same accuracy as the barrier, as the NAB, because you are doing a NAB on one point. But you still have to just avoid any No, no, you do an app but on one point, yeah, which is okay. Yeah. So you don't have to do the entire path, but you do yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, for the talk. I thought it was already pretty uh, very nice view. Uh, I mean, my main question is related to the fact that in the every day we produce some of the data. I mean, from materials, uh, from material science. So I was wondering if you know of uh, some efforts, uh, like, like uh, for example, these for batteries, where you really, you know, collect data that are produced in a more or less fashion, so that you know we can really build some databases, so that uh, you know you don't have to really repeat uh, <laughs> over and over the same simulations, and maybe you know we have a consistent database where you, I don't know, maybe also we are also able to machine learn some really huge. So uh, I think for, we in material science are a bit behind compared to some other fields. Uh, materials project is one of the places yeah. we have now we have Optimate that is sort of similar concept right, where everybody is putting in the data. But this um, that I mean, if you look at uh, other communities, at the bio community or even like high entropy, uh, high energy physics, then they were much more advanced than us in in doing this. Um, so what I think for us, optimally, is probably one of the best places to go right now. Or normal. I don't know if normal is part of optimally. It is, right? Yeah. So, but it's still, I mean, then you have to select a different database. So it's not really that interoperable, but at least it's a place where you store or you collect. Yeah, I don't know. Question about your late breeds and uh, I should get the uh, screen. There's a different dimension morphology mm -hmm. that somehow, I mean, happens with, with different scales, uh, length scales. So right. uh, I was wondering whether uh, it's relevant or not that this level in the screen can also have some simulations for uh, larger periods, like, uh, I don't know, 
Microscale. Relevant for sure. How to do it? I don't know. We are trying. We, the, I have a proposal I, I work with that we are trying to do something like that. I'm not an expert in multi scale or in, uh, in anything that is goes beyond that. Be, be, uh, beyond the, the nanometer, but we are. I think it's very. I mean, it's the goal of going beyond the, the simple DFT level, right? But for doing that, then we need to integrate also with ontologies and with the protocols and make sure that we are because we are targeting different communities. I mean, if I do my calculation and you you do yours, most likely we produce data that are slightly different, right? I mean. The, the way that we analyze the data is different and so on. So then if you cross communities, then you need to make sure that you are able to, to make the data interoperable with each other. So it's it is a bit tricky, but for sure, I mean, going multi-scale is, is where we have to go, especially for some of the technologies where you know, it's not enough to look at the uh, atomistic level. I don't know how to answer. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a uh, very engaging talk. It's very important to hear what you've been doing this. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, have there been any efforts um, to calculate some, let's say, thermal properties for uh, potential uh, uh, thermal electricity applications? I think so. Uh, it was uh, Andrea was checking out this. Because I instantly have this uh, these uh, squares with triangles in mind your your table yeah. where I would just want to see like uh, thermal conductivity and electric conductivity and perhaps other dimensions. Yeah, it just uh, reminded me of. Yeah, so to calculate electric conductivity is a little bit tricky because uh, we try with this uh, Boltzmann uh, method and uh, we spent six months and we failed because uh, it's uh, in some cases worse and some other they don't. So you need to be very careful on that. And thermal conductivity very, I mean, it's, it's yeah, you need to, to find a way to calculate thermal conductivity. I mean, DFT is zero Kelvin, right? Yeah. So I think you can do it. It's just something that, uh, I mean, most of my group focuses on, on, uh, on ionic conductivity. Mm -hmm. We would like to find a way to do it. Like, start with electronic conductivity, but uh, uh, we had a big setback right before the holidays. It was not fun. <laughs> so uh, we find out basically all the materials we had were at all the same conductivity. Like okay, this makes no sense. Yeah. And uh, where we were supposed to. So it works for metals, but not for oxides. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have a question, Yuri. Yeah, well, it was just to connect with the question I guess from the beginning that when you talk about machine learning. So I mean there are different ways you can use machine learning. One of the, the ways you mentioned is try to learn trends and try to predict what's the next next thing here, which is another calculation. I don't think you could use it as a way to sort of speed up the calculations that you are already thinking, for example, for visibility and so I'm going to try to look more of it. If you were aware about this work on you know, Boris, you can see on the current potential yes. networks and where we would work in the world. So I guess this would be a really rich playground, this setup that you already have. Like you, you running this massive workload, you're getting all this data. And then if the data is already there, you have models to sort of learn from it and try to do that for calculations would be nice. And also, I guess, like the holy grail of this approach would be to have this kind of active learning scheme where your models sort of very able to also predict the uncertainty in their predictions. Yes. And then you already have this automatic workflow that your model could call and you could do the analytical calculation and yeah, yeah. So we are doing that basically for the the finales that I show you. It does something similar, and most of these uh, I I've seen it work mostly for molecules because it's it's a bit. I mean, you have many more molecules than 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 than, than uh, solids, right? The problem here is the the training set that you know if you take uh, uh, you you have a very very sparse matrix. And, uh, and I need to know where to put my time. And I'm more interested in the DFT yeah. part rather than machine learning. But I would love to see any machine learning uh, integrated with this 
So uh, that that's definitely very interesting, but you know, time is is time. Yeah, time is killing you exactly. So that's Thomas. No, yes. So so my question is on the phone. So uh, the problem, so the problem that I see with the all these makers inside is the fact that they are really um, subjective, if you want. So. Of course, let's say you studied this all your life, let's say. So you know more or less the problems for you. And if you automatize, yes. You now, uh, I see these touches with not working only because I see that whenever a new project comes, uh, it can be the math or something like in the American ones, the, the, the Chinese ones. Um, it's because of, I, I, the people that are in the project, uh, that are, are, you know, are, are, get the job of the project, uh, they think that they have a better problem. So everyone thinks that they have a better problem. Because they spend their life to, let's say, to, uh, to, 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 to understand. And so if you, if you go to the other book, say that, that they do this bad, they go to you, you say, you say this, they, these people are doing these things bad. And so, so my problem is the fact that so people that this problem is because in time, because only time solves the problem, right? Yeah. So at some point something emerges yes. that, that is, is way better than anything else. And so mm -hmm. people understand that it's impossible not to use. Yes. Or do you think the problem will be solved uh, in a very formal way, for example? So a very mathematical way that says, uh, no, I have uh, like a theorem that says that uh, this is the correct way to do it because uh, I found the probability that this is uh, uh, so, 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 yeah, do, do you do you do you do the daily problem first? Uh, and yes. how, how do you think it will be solved? So, yes, definitely there is a problem. And I answer you with the two questions What is the best exchange correlation function? <laughs> what is the best PFT code? <laughs> right? We are not solving that yet. And the DFT, we have. I mean, uh, what is best between VASP and GECO or VASP and Quantum Espresso? And what is the best exchange? I mean, in the 80s, uh, as far as I know, I was very far from physics at that point. <laughs> but uh, there were, everybody was making their own exchange correlation function. And then suddenly, you know, PBE emerged on that because, you know, there was a cleanup and say, oh, we use PBE because it's more standard. So I think at the end, you will always find somebody who says, my method is better uh, or that has enough power to just spread and say, you know, why Matita's product is good is because more people have start using it. Or why VASP is good? Because there are a bunch of people that use it. So I think that uh, you will always find different uh, people that, that, that they think that they have, uh, they have different uh, approaches. And that's also how science goes on, right? Because uh, you get new ideas. And at the end, we have all big egos and we like to find that we do things better than others. Uh, so <laughs> that's uh, that. I, I I don't think that we. I mean uh, that we need really to solve this. The problem is the point is to make things interoperable. So in a way that the things that I'm doing can be used by somebody else. I'm not claiming that binding is the best, but could be used by somebody else. I don't want to keep it back for myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the way. Right? I mean, maybe there is somebody. It's the same idea with. Uh, open source codes and so on. I mean, you have these two codes that they do exactly the same thing, but maybe one is faster than the other, and then they are all open source. If you if you care, you can go in and make it better. You can go in and work on this. So I don't. I think it is a problem that actually is there, but not necessarily will be bad, as long as we make things that they they can work with each other. I mean, if you make a thing that works and you you close it, there are some codes that you cannot even bench, right? Then, then maybe it's not that useful. But if you have a, a if you if you are open and if you are open also to, to learn from others, that might be. Beautiful. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, yeah, one thing. Uh, the big format of the approach. So I mean, even if, if even there, there are competition with that. I mean, why are you write approaches and there is a Universal format for that or uh, well, I'm not really developing an ontology. I think that we don't. There are a few ontologies. There is the MMO for modeling and the MMC for materials, right? Uh, uh, Bat info is the first ontology in batteries. 
Uh, and I think it's done in a way that is integrated with the, the available ontologies. So the point is to try to use the same sort of language. Uh, and uh, and I didn't show today, but one of the things we are trying to do is also an ontology for data. So that you you have the data that are connected with the ontology by itself, not only the method, but also the data itself. And then you want to be interoperable with uh, with everything. So I think that really the key here, and come on, this is going back to your question, is the, the fact of being interoperable, making things that can be used by many people, as many people as possible and be reused, right? So the chemistry neutral, technology agnostic is really the way to go because, you know, I show conductivities, but basically I have five or six people working on this and all of them they have their individual project, but they're working on the same structure or the same protocol. And, you know, with AIDA is the same. I mean, you have individual project, but you want to develop something bigger. Yeah. I have a small curiosity. And by the beginning of the talk, you, I think you mentioned that um, the materials here we're looking at for magnesium batteries, right? Yes. They have very low voltages. Yeah. Why is that? Is there a intrinsic reason for that? I think it's because, so in, uh, in well, the voltage you calculate by energy difference, right? So if the energy, they, lithium apparently, you it takes a, a much more energy to, to, to extract. Magnesium, the one, well, the one that works for batteries is actually uh, only so far this one, this sugar phase, that is one point one. So it's I think because of molybdenum, or because of no, I think it's not not exchanging too much. No, no, it's actually exchange no. both electrons. It's ah. a plus two, so it's just a you know it's an energy that you get out. So molybdenum n plus and you know, n plus two plus uh, they they are yeah. closing it, yeah basically. So, but I think it's already the sugar. I mean, you can find the, I, uh, I mean, you need to use molybdenum because it's second row, so it's bigger and it's more space for him. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you have, uh, yeah. Okay. But I, I, I never really went into, I mean, it, it, I don't know if there are actually uh, open circuit or materials that the energy difference between the, the structure with magnesium without have a high voltage, mm -hmm. uh, but then they don't work for batteries. Okay. I know that the one working with batteries is, is 1.1. And of course, it's much yeah. worse than what you have. Not for cars. Cars. Not for cars. Uh, but I don't think even for a phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, no. no, probably not. <laughs> OK, other questions? Yeah. Well, if not, uh, let's thank. Uh, <laughs>